4 in our magma chamber dynamics discussion will be assimilation. Assimilation. This is the process where country rock gets brought into the magma chamber, either by, well, mostly by melting. So let's say the assimilation, this means the um, incorporation of country rock by melting. We put the country rock above its liquidus and it will just start to dissolve basically into the magma. And in response, this is drastically going to change the composition. It will change composition of the magma either in its isotopes, its trace elements, or its major elements. Our sketch for this will be, uh, here's the ground surface, and we have a magma chamber underground. We put plus signs to symbolize magma chamber. That's pretty common practice in geology. And let's have this, to make this be a really pronounced system, go ahead, um, make your lines really straight. This is going to be sedimentary rock that the magma chamber is intruding into. And let's have it be... Let's give it the pattern of a limestone, which is that brick pattern. So take your time, make it look real clean. My lines, of course, are a little sloppy because it's hard to write on this notepad. But this is the pattern for a limestone. And what's the mineral that makes up limestone? It's calcite. So here is limestone. And that is composed of calcite with the chemical formula CaCO3. And so every bit of heat that is like rising up off of that magma chamber is baking and then could start melting and destroying that calcite. In fact, it could start incorporating chunks of limestone that like break off in, which and then these start to just fade away and melt away. And so by melting limestone, we're going to increase the calcium and also the CO2, and CO2 potentially in the magma. We're changing its composition. And that's the process of assimilation in a nutshell. It produces both textural and compositional effects. I think it's a pretty easy um, idea to think about. It's, we could think about it, or we could add a couple more words here. Let's say contact metamorphism, because that is absolutely associated with assimilation. And I also want to add a new word to your vocabulary, and it's called an oriole. This is how it's spelled. Oriole. And what an oriole is, it's a band, a contact zone around the magma chamber. So we could have a thermal oriole or a compositional oriole of contact metamorphism that extends away from the magma chamber by one meter or even hundreds of meters away. It's going to depend on how big that magma chamber is. Sometimes we will assimilate up to 10%. Well, let's say, so 10% or even tens, put a little S there, tens of percent of country rock. Let's look at the different evidences to support how important assimilation is. There is textural evidence. Textural evidence in the form of xenoliths. Well, I guess we also see contact evidence. Sometimes we'll actually see contact margins. But xenoliths are our primary evidence. Now, a xenolith is a foreign lithic fragment stuck in a magma. I'll show you a picture after we do the definitions. So a xenolith, your definition you're going to put down, is a foreign lithic fragment of unknown origin. It's just a chunk of country rock floating in a magma. So in our sketch that we did right here, this little chunk of material broke off the country rock and is now fully incorporated in the magma. That is a xenolith. Well, kind of. We actually know if it's limestone and this is limestone, it's not a foreign origin. It's not xeno. Instead, it's just a lithic fragment. And so we should add a definition here too. If you actually know where materials from, 
it's called an inclusion. So this is a lithic, lithic fragment of known origin. You need to specifically know exactly where it's coming from. So most of the time we talk about xenoliths, but sometimes we should be using the word inclusion. Importantly, all of these tend to be angular because the lithic fragment itself was solid and that helps to distinguish from enclaves, which is that evidence of magma mixing. Let me show you a cool field photo. This is from an outcrop here in Texas where I live. Or in Texas, we've got this granite body that's a billion years old. And inside of this granite, there are xenoliths of schist. We see that um, foliated metamorphic fabric. And you can see how these are somewhat angular blocks that have broken off of the wall rock and have been incorporated in the magma. We even see evidence of some of these starting to dissolve away as they're being assimilated into the magma. So this is what I want you to picture in mind as you think xenolith. Now let's go to the compositional evidence and we're going to use Harker variation diagrams again. Compositional uh, evidence. Uh, and so we're going to just we're going to go to a variation diagram and this is a variation diagram you could sketch if you wanted to in your notes. I pulled this from a paper and it's about a volcano called Paricutin. Paricutin erupted in 1943 in Mexico in a farmer's cornfield. It's a very fascinating volcano volcanological event. And over the years it ended up erupting. So let's just this is an example from Paricutin. Coutin, Mexico. It erupts in 1943 in a, in a farmer's field. It erupts for a period of nine years. It builds a volcano that's 400 meters tall before it goes extinct. It sends lava flows out across the country that um, bury uh, two towns. And when geologists, after the fact, plotted up the composition of the lavas against Delta 18O, this is an isotope now. So this is using a variation diagram because we're showing the variation in one element or isotope against another. We're plotting against SiO2 like we've done in our other examples. But this is an isotope of 18 oxygen to 16 oxygen. And it can be a sensitive recorder of assimilation. And what the geologist showed, the geochemist showed, is that the starting magma would evolve through through time in this direction and along a linear trend. Anytime we see linearity, we try to explain it by either mixing, fractional crystallization, or in this case, they found that assimilation was the best explanation because they looked at the country rock in the area and it plotted an isot as more enriched an oxygen isotope. And so if we um, progressively mix in more and more of this material to our starting basalt, we would fall along that tie line. So I think this is a good, powerful example of magma assimilation using isotopes. Something to remember, okay? We can do it with major elements, trace elements, and with isotopes. And now, to wrap up this lecture, we need to go to Roman numeral 5, and really this whole entire topic, and this is just an, a tie-in now of magma processes and tectonics. So let's say... How do we say this in our notes? We're going to say AFC and tectonics because there is a relationship um, with how magmas evolve depending on where you are in our different tectonic regimes. That, that the crustal thickness provides a filter that affects how magmas are forming at subduction zones relative to rifts and also to... Let's see, how do we draw a hotspot? That was probably a terrible, terrible hotspot. But let's just say hotspot. And if you wanted to pause the video here and make a quick subduction zone sketch, add a hotspot and a rift, we can say that, um, that, that um, percent melting during magma genesis and crustal thickness exert... a um, systematic behavior, all right, exist a systematic control. And this is shown in two classic diagrams that I just want to briefly introduce to you right now. 
The first is not one that you've never seen before. It's that TAS diagram. So here we're putting in the TAS. And in fact, well, here's what I want you to do in your notes. I want you to go ahead and draw TAS, right, SiO2, and then here you go alkalize. And I want you to put in a dividing line. And that dividing line that you've just put in is this dividing line right here. And what this is saying is that there, there tends to be on Earth two different suites of magmas. There is a suite of magmas that are called subalkaline, and there's a suite of magmas that are called alkaline. Right? And we have those words here and here. And these are controlled by tectonics, where the subalkaline series, and this is what this is what, this is what you're putting in your notes. The subalkaline, this is mid-ocean ridge, right? The rifting divergent environment, and also subduction zones, convergent boundaries. Whereas alkaline, this is hot spot. That's one behavior that I want you to know here. And that's because hotspots are lower percent partial melting, which ends up increasing the amount of alkalis you have. Okay. But this subalkaline field that has mid-ocean ridge and subduction zone, we'd like to have a graph that can separate those out. And that brings us to the next diagram. And you're going to draw something like this in your notes. I'll draw it, draw it here with you, and this is what we're replicating in our drawing. So it's basically a triangle, and we call these ternary diagrams. And this is the MGO corner. Here is our alkalis, alkalis, A-L-K corner, and here is our F-E-O corner. And so this diagram is called an A-F-M diagram. And you plot the composition of your magma relative to these three, just like we did as we were like learning how to plot rock types, where this would be 100 MgO and this line back here is 0 MgO. And basalts from all tectonic environments plot right about here. Here, and we'll say this is a basalt. And as that magma evolves, we notice two trends in, in, in most natural rocks, subalkaline rocks. There's a trend that goes this way, and there's a trend that goes this way, and it's controlled by tectonics. So our red trend here, this is produced by, progress, by, by crystallizing magnesium-rich minerals, by crystallizing something rich in magnesium, like olivine, we drive the composition towards iron, but no iron phase stabilizes for a long time. And so the melt becomes progressively enriched in um, iron until eventually magnetite crystallizes, right? So we have an inversion point and iron starts to crystallize and then we start going down this way. And so as the magma evolves from basalt, uh, where would we put andesite? Andesite might be here and then dacite and then rhyolite, as we progressively go through that composition, we have different crystallization. And this trend here is for, this in red, this is for mid-ocean ridge basalts, or mid-ocean, let's just call it mid-ocean ridge systems. The textbook uses a brand new word here. They call it a tholeite. But really, I just want you to think about it as the mid-ocean ridge, the divergent plate boundary, um, crystallization progression in terms of magnesium, iron, and alkalis. This trend in blue, this is our subduction zone behavior. And this is calc. In the textbook, they call it also calc alkaline, alkaline trend. And here we have basalts and then our dacites and our rhyolites, and there's no iron enrichment. And that's the key here. We have no Fe enrichment. Whereas in our mid-ocean ridge system, there's pro pronounced iron enrichment. And so why do we not have iron enrichment in subduction zones? Well, to do it in a short way, subduction zones have a lot of water, right, associated with their magma genesis. That water provides a lot of oxygen right here. That oxygen stabilizes, it stabilizes magnetite. 
And since we have a stable magnetite, we can drop iron. Yeah? We, so we stabilize magnetite, it soaks up iron, and so iron is always dropping at the same time that olivine and clinopyroxene and anorthite are all crystallizing as well. Whereas in the mid-ocean ridge tholeites, we are in an environment that's very reduced. Reduced. It is low oxygen, and so we have no magnetite that forms. And so we have um, iron enrichment. We're just dabbling into the field now of geochemistry, but I wanted to show you how another type of variation diagram can be used with the help of fractional crystallization, specifically of magnetite, to create different trends to tell us about plate tectonics.